Please be seated. <clears throat> Executive Vice President Tolstoy, faculty colleagues, alumni, doctoral candidates, and their families and friends. Good afternoon and welcome to Convocation for PhD Candidates in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia University. I thank you all for coming to celebrate the many accomplishments of our doctoral candidates. We honor today a magnificent group that on commencement this coming Wednesday will receive the highest academic degree in the land. Let that sink in. <laughs> who will join the ranks of our close to 40,000 alumni and who will embark on professional and academic careers around the world in the great tradition of Columbia University. Our candidates will always remember this day. Even with the passing of the years, they will manage to recall that their Columbia PhD convocation took place on the very day in which the fate of Daenerys Targaryen <laughs> and the Iron Throne were fulfilled. But I digress. <laughs> Equally important, we also honor today the families and friends of our candidates who have endured with them the long rigors of their academic pursuit. Thank you for being so supportive and understanding, and above all, so very patient. <laughs> I would ask all PhD candidates to rise and applaud those friend and family members, friends and family members who have also helped them to be here today, please. The student remarks to the graduating class will be offered by Jason Wong. Jason, <laughs> Jason Wong graduate, graduated summa cum laude with a BS in environmental science and policy and a BA in Germanic studies from the University of Maryland and is a PhD candidate in sustainable development. His his dissertation combines economics, policy, and science to study how aviation connectivity stimulates innovation and how climate change impacts critical infrastructures. Jason grew up in Hong Kong and Shanghai with family roots in Maryland. He has, a long, he has long been a dedicated teacher. He was on this stage two years ago when he won the 2017 Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching by Graduate Students after being a two-time finalist in 2015 and 2016. Jason's research has been recognized with an award from the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. His passion for international diplomacy, policy, and language led him to become last year one of the eight international parliamentary fellows representing the United States at the German Parliament. Mr. Wong. This is a lot scarier uh, than before. Dean Alonzo and Executive Vice President Tolstoy, faculty and staff, dear family, friends, and of course, the PhD class of 2019. I'm ecstatic and honored to be able to deliver the student speech here today. First of all, I would like to thank my advisor, Scott Barrett, as well as my committee members, Jeffrey Heal, John Mutter, Jackie Klopp, and Radley Horton, 
and so many other faculty and staff members here who have advised and mentored me over the years. And of course, my family and friends who are in the audience today. Having defended my dissertation on aviation and sustainable development, I can now read for pleasure again. Right now, I'm reading a book written by a pilot named Mark Van Herniker, so I didn't go very far from my field. And um, in this book, Mark chronicles his journey in pursuing his passion for flying and the unique views he gathers from 30,000 feet. Today, I'm here to talk with you about one idea that resonated with me, and it is the idea of a place lag. So what is a place lag, you might ask? Well, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of a jet lag. After a long transoceanic flight, you're probably really tired because the time zone changes cause a sense of disorientation. Jet lag, by and large, is temporal. Place lag, on the other hand, is spatial. It is the displacement of place rather than time that causes the sense of disorientation. A place lag can persist even after you have corrected for the jet lag. We have felt place lags everywhere, in our new beds on campus, at that new cafe that is part of your routine now, and your new jogging route along the Hudson, and even a brand new language spoken around you. These are all physical dimensions of a place lag that we have experienced one way or another as a graduate student. Sure enough, these kinds of lags took time to get used to, but we nonetheless adjusted. And yes, we experience place lags all over again when we go travel to a conference or we go out and do field work. New York City and Colombia became our new home base. At some point, we began to measure and com compare places with a new baseline. We use Central Park for size. We use time uh, with LaGuardia, how long it takes to get there. And the prices of subconscious sandwiches became our new currency units. We also feel place lags as, as our very familiar places to us morph into the new. What used to be Ollie's at the corner of 116 and Broadway has now become Shake Shack. Like many establishments that have come and gone, but to those of us who began our time here at Columbia some years ago, I'm not gonna say how many, the geography of Morningside Heights, and indeed our sense of place, will always be anchored by our first impressions when we first arrived on this campus. And then one day, we realize this discomfort that we feel spends more than just the change in physical place. Our academic or professional place also suffered a significant lag. Once upon a time, we were the best in our subjects. All of a sudden, we became imposters. Everyone's pedigree makes us question whether we were the accidental admit. Maybe you struggled with your first year coursework like me, or dreaded through the comprehensive exams or the master thesis. Before we knew it, the next phase of this kind of place lag hits us in full force. Are we considered successful if we don't end up with a shiny academic placement out there on the job market? Thankfully, we had a community here who helped us cope with the academic place lag. I'm really grateful to my program and my program comrades who offered me their patience and intellectual unpacking of some of these feelings. Mental health is a central component of graduate school education. Let us not hide it as a taboo, as it has been too often the case, and take a moment to celebrate those of us who are newly learning how to seek help when we need it, as well as those who have found ways to train and learn more about our minds. <laughs> Unmentioned so far, though, is one other dimension of a place lag that I want to talk about. This is beyond the physical or the academic. This is a more abstract, more identity-based kind of place lag. It is a kind of disorientation or discomfort as a result of being out of place, cognitively or socially, in your surroundings. 
It is the feeling of you don't belong, not because you're changing your physical places or because of your academic or professional places being changed. It is because we have no choice but to continuously confront assumptions other made for us or we have made for ourselves. Sometimes these kinds of questions and comments you encounter can come from very benevolent places. Have you ever been asked the question, where are you from? Followed almost immediately by the answer, no, no, no. I mean, where are you really from? Apparently, I just got the wrong answer. For others, your place lag may have roots in racism, sexism, xenophobia, or other forms of unconscious biases. Those, those of us here who command a different accent, who come from international or different migration backgrounds, who are of racial minorities, who are of a different sexual orientation or gender identity, have you ever been told that you did something really well for your sex or gender? Have you ever been told uh, that you uh, have to have a discussion before you decide where or when you can hold hands with your partner? Did you have to try to muster a smile when a complete stranger in the New York subway utters the only Japanese words they know to try to greet you? Have you been told that you speak your mother tongue language surprisingly well? Have you read dating profiles that explicitly mentions that your race is not welcome? I know that your plays lags, your stories have been similar. Dealing with this particular form of place lag, which by the way can happen in New York City and at Columbia, involves a delicate balance of maintaining some grace and dignity, educating yet not condescending, and simultaneously fulfilling some form of cultural or gender expectation. As a queer Chinese American cis male person, I know that this sort of place lag will be lifelong, and that my negotiation with it has to happen both internally and externally. At Columbia, I was glad to be able to train as a peer advocate at the Gay Health Advocacy Project. I got to learn not just more about sexual health stigma and issues surrounding the LGBTQ plus community, but also about how to talk about these issues with others. At Columbia, I got better at dealing with some of these abstract forms of the place lag, but it is far from over. We, the newly minted PhD graduates at Columbia, already enjoy a special vantage point. Our education here challenges us to understand many different forms of place lags, indeed the physical, the academic, and personal, and beyond, and we are able to reach out to the people who are newly feeling these kinds of lags in all corners of our communities. If today, what I mentioned, if very few of the place lags I mentioned to you applied to you, I invite you to reflect on why you got to experience so few of these place lags. And think about doing something about these place lags that you see other people facing. You too have the power to do something to shrink some of these lags. Dear class of 2019, we may very well be able to tackle the physical place lags on our own by adjusting and interacting with our new environments. We may very well be able to find a supportive environment to overcome the academic or professional place lags we will be encountering. But to address this last form of place lag I mentioned, we need all hands on deck. This is no time to be complacent. Perhaps our time at Columbia was about gaining a set of tools, not to fully overcome all of the kinds of place lags that we can experience, but to ascend to that challenge. Much like how a pilot had to learn the new geographies of the skies, we are learning how to navigate our own place lags with a dose of courage and a strong ethic. Dear class of 2019, go and soar high in these Columbia blue skies. Thank you and congratulations again to the class of 2019.
Thank you, Mr. Wong. Today's keynote address will be offered by Professor Rosalind Morris. Rosalind Morris is Professor of Anthropology at Columbia. She joined the faculty in 1994 and has served as the director for the Institute for Research on Women and Gender and as associate director of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. Professor Morris's work addresses two broad sets of questions. The first concerns the histories, political economies, and social lives, including the deaths and afterlives of natural resource extraction. The second concerns the force of the mass media in the transformations associated with modernity. She has undertaken extensive ethnographic fieldwork in Southern Africa and in Southeast Asia. Professor Moritz is the author of seven books and more than 70 essays. Her work has been recognized with awards and fellowships from the Social Science Research Council, the American Academy in Berlin, the Institute for Cultural Technology and Media Philosophy in Weimar, the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and the Rockefeller Center at Bellagio. In addition to her scholarly work, Professor Morris is a filmmaker, poet, and libertist. Professor Morris. Dean Alonzo, Executive Vice President Tolstoy, assembled faculty, students and guests, I'm deeply honored to have the opportunity to address you today. And I'm especially pleased that I can join you as you celebrate the receipt of your doctoral degrees because this is also the 25th anniversary of my own arrival here as a member of the faculty. Then, in 1994, as Carlos has already mentioned, I was probably a lot like you. A newly minted PhD, enormously hopeful, a little afraid, and a lot uncertain about how to make the transition from being a student to being a professional. Most of you have spent the better part of a decade in pursuit of this degree, reading, experimenting in labs and at the drawing board, doing research in libraries and archives, and in field sites around the world. Your doctoral degree confers on you recognition for what you know. But above all, it recognizes the fact that you have learned to learn. And this skill above all will you take with you into the world, where it will serve you no matter what discoveries arise, no matter what fashions come and go. For this, you can be both proud and grateful. I join you in thanking your parents, your siblings, your friends, your lovers, your spouses, your children, for their support throughout your time here. And I also want to recognize your teachers and your colleagues, including both your advocates and your critics. For as scholars, we depend on both. And yes, I speak of we. Today opens a horizon in which the community of Columbia's doctorates has expanded to include you in its we. We welcome you today to a community that includes both those who have gone before and those who are yet to come. My hope for your future is that you will be able to realize the enormous talents that brought you here. But I know that this is a difficult time and even a dangerous moment in which to enter what we sometimes refer to as the real world. And this is, of course, a false distinction. The university is in and of the world, and the world is in it. Its privileged place, protected by the institution of academic freedom and sustained by the great knowledge and wealth concentrated here, nonetheless derives from its critical function, a function that is always under threat and that requires your collective defense. The question is, how shall we realize that function? So as I contemplated what I would say to you today, I could not help but recall the following lines from a little novella by Gertrude Stein. I know it is just the most dangerous moment in our history, in a kind of a way as dangerous, more dangerous than the Civil War. 
Daily, we are assailed by terrifying stories about environmental destruction and life-threatening climate change. A relentless spool of images from foreign war zones and inner cities blighted by racial hatred unfurls by the hour on our screens. Some of you have been personally wounded by these horrors, and many of you have devoted yourself to the pursuit of remedies for these problems, and we wish you much success in that endeavor. Indeed, we depend upon it. Now, the words I just quoted about these dangerous times were written by Stein in 1946. Nonetheless, the danger she saw then was not unrelated to the danger that faces us now. To be sure, Stein did not anticipate the planetary threat posed by fossil fuel consumption, deforestation, and the use of plastics. But there are other points on which she may offer us some insight. First, she was concerned that it would be difficult for people to learn how to end a war. And she was afraid that the world to which her characters were returning was one in which they would be obsessed with jobs and unable to find the means to satisfy their inner needs. The standardization of life worried her, as did production for its own sake. Second, she was concerned that something was happening to language, that it was becoming formulaic and, as a result, its capacity to express either the consciousness of its speakers or the truths of the world was at risk. People, she wrote, were all beginning to articulate alike. More than 70 years later, this country and much of the world is still at war. And if Stein reviled Gallup polls for their yes, no answers to complex questions, we live in the era of alternative facts, internet trolling, hashtag politics, and hate masquerading as free speech. In a time of click farms and robocalls, it is not easy to know how to judge the speech that claims to represent the interests or desires or aspiration of those in our midst, never mind those who reside in more distant places. But you, who have completed your degrees by submitting and defending a dissertation, know, as Catarina, a Brazilian woman, said to the anthropologist Joao Biel, you know that thinking means caring for the words. To accept the mantle of the doctorate is to accept the task of caring for the words. This is a strange kind of care we ask you to perform, for we ask you to do so in the very moment that you subject everything else to question. And indeed, it is the unique and necessary task of the university to protect this double mandate of caring for the words because they are our only vehicles for truth-telling and critically interrogating the received truths of our respective disciplines. This task, without which there can be neither justice nor science, calls us to defend the university against all the forces that would subordinate it to the political or corporate interests of a few. It calls us to defend the only instrument we have to forge relations, make peace, and question ourselves. But what does it mean to care for words, and which words? Perhaps we can start with leadership. You have spent the last several years in competition with yourselves and each other as you have tried to excel and prepare yourselves for leadership in your respective fields. And this is as it should be. And yet, today, you sit next to each other as recipients of the same degree, an equality of sorts. Perhaps you're sitting next to someone you have never met. Perhaps your parents or your spouse or your friend is sitting next to someone from a country they have never visited, who speaks languages they have never heard. Regardless of whether you come from upstate New York or South Asia, East Asia or West Africa, you are here as a member of Columbia's community and this community holds you, whether you are an immigrant, as am I, or someone descended of generations of Americans, native, voluntary, or captive. This community holds you, whether you are, as am I, the first woman in a family to receive a doctorate, 
or even a college education, or whether your parents and grandparents were scholars. Regardless of whether you share the same political beliefs or religious commitments, whether or not you inhabit the same understandings of sexual identity or have a racial history in common, you sit next to each other, equal and alike in this accomplishment. What could it mean to lead here among equals who are both like and unlike, who share an experience but not a long history? We say we value leadership, but we rarely define it. And for lack of such definition, leaders, as Stein also remarked, can sometimes lead you where you do not want to go. For lack of such definition, contemporary society often measures leaders by the number of their followers on social media. Let us not go there. Well then, what about equality? As we know, equality is one of the guiding concepts of this Republican democracy, and to my mind, it is one of the most important political concepts ever adduced. But as we also know, this same concept has been abused since the beginning. The history of civil rights activism to which many people at this university have devoted themselves over the decades has been a history of labors to realize this concept, to ensure that its constitutive exclusions be overcome time and time again. And such struggles must indeed be undertaken time and time again. While rights are protections enshrined in law, they can be revoked. Freedoms can be and are not infrequently withdrawn. And the realm of equality can contract to become the mere privilege of those who believe they are like each other and who would exclude all others. But if the word is to be valued, equality must obtain between those who are unlike. If it does not, it is mere resemblance. This is why we need to care for the word and by so caring, work for its realization. For when equality means equal access to inequality, when it is limited by identity so that it obtains only among those who resemble each other, then it has become an empty and indeed a dangerously vacuous term. Limited in this way, it becomes the fertile soil in which tyrannical leadership grows. At present, people around the world are adulating powerful figures whose paradigm for leadership also dominated Stein's time, dictatorial power vested in individual men who led people where, I hope, we would not want to go. To go back to that model of leadership with its dreams of power and domination would doom us all you must find a better way. You, we, must find a better way. An alternative dominated neither by celebrity followership nor based in the idea that a right to rule rides, resides in the exception. You do so in a moment of utmost urgency when your decisions must feel especially burdensome. But to the extent that these tasks are urgent and burdensome, they are also opportunities to make a profound and lasting difference. We hope we have prepared you well for this role, but you will also need to exercise your own judgment as you enter not the real world, but other worlds. These worlds are conjoined, but they are not one. They are internally differentiated and oftentimes divided by structures that distribute opportunity and especially education unequally. We at this great institution are also part of those structures, beneficiaries even when we want to and do oppose them. A great and grave responsibility comes with that status. As an anthropologist, I spend a great deal of my own research life in places deprived of the most basic amenities, often without electricity, sanitation, or sufficient food to end a day without hunger, my friends in these places, many of whom are undocumented migrants, dream of receiving an education. If not for themselves, then for their children. 
Yes, in severe poverty, they would like to receive an education. They do not have the means to claim it or treat it as a right, as Adrian Rich urged graduates of Douglas College to do in 1977. Sometimes they granted a nearly magical status and assume, as we sometimes do, that a certificate of education, a diploma such as you will soon receive, will transform their lives and grant them the recognition that they long for and are otherwise denied. On the one hand, this desire is entirely understandable and we cannot wish it away. On the other hand, it reflects the forces that traverse both their world and ours that can join them in a structure of inequality. So as I conclude, I want to persuade you that what Adrian Rich said to graduates half a century ago remains the case. To care for the word education means not reducing it to its certificate, not thinking of it only in terms of credit hours or grades received, returns on investment, or the value-added dimension of your resume. That kind of thinking would only reproduce the forces that have been gathering since even before Stein wrote her worried lament in 1946, but that have a new shape and urgency today. When I said that the university is in the world and that the world is in the university, this is what I meant. How you think of your education here, how you choose to actualize its lessons, will not only reflect how you think of the world, but it will shape how you go about changing it. And that, in turn, will shape this university. To bear the responsibility of education, we need to enact the special freedoms that are accorded a university like this one to ensure not its exceptional status as a world apart, but its protected role in enabling us to engage the world justly and in pursuit of justice, here and there and in the relations between them, wherever they may be. Welcome to this shared responsibility which we inherit from the past and which we owe to the future. Welcome and congratulations. Dean Alonzo, Executive Vice President Tolstoy, assembled faculty, students and guests, I thank you for this privilege of speaking to you today. Thank you, Professor Morris. I now have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Sarah Arkebauer, a PhD candidate in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, and the president of the Arts and Sciences Graduate Council, who will present the Faculty Mentoring Awards. Ms. Arkebauer. Today, I have the distinct privilege of representing all GSAS students and recognizing two outstanding professors. The Arts and Sciences Graduate Council, ASGC, instituted this award in 2004 to commemorate excellence in the mentoring of doctoral and master's students. The award is a student initiative. Selections were made entirely by graduate student representatives from GSAS based on student nomination letters across all disciplines. Today, we honor Professor Meredith Gamer, Assistant Professor of Art History and Archaeology, and Professor Amy Starcheski, Director of the Master's Program in Oral History. Professor Gamer. <laughs> Professor Gamer, the selection committee was very impressed by the nomination letters received on your behalf. Here are a few highlights. Meredith approaches her students with quiet confidence and deep-seated intellectual curiosity. She exemplifies the pedagogical model that understands learning as taking place with the right combination of challenge and support. From graduate seminars to dissertation defenses, Meredith consistently holds us to the highest standards of scholarly rigor while giving us the tools to succeed. I was immediately captivated with art in the British Empire because of Professor Gamer's meticulous curation of readings and discussion topics, and because of her ability to deftly lead productive class discussions. 
Observing her interact with undergraduates as her TA constituted perhaps the most effective lesson in pedagogy I have received at Columbia. Her ability to be a great scholar and a great person, one whose patience, care, and compassion are as boundless as they are generously bestowed are rare. As a junior faculty member, Meredith doesn't have much time to spare, but she makes the time, and in so doing, makes the graduate students in her midst confident, empowered, and better equipped for the challenges that lie beyond the PhD program. On behalf of all graduate students at Columbia University, we want to thank you for demonstrating outstanding mentorship of students. Effective mentoring is not only the key to a successful graduate program, but its benefits will pass on as a tradition of quality mentoring practices throughout the rest of your students. Professor Starczewski. The selection committee was very impressed by the nomination letters received on your behalf. Here are a few highlights. Dr. Amy Starczewski is everything someone could hope for in an academic mentor. She encourages her students to think about the oral history practice not just as a series of interviews, but as real catalysts for social change. She encourages us as her students to consider in greater depth the social, cultural, and political factors that shape how people interact with their communities and by extension with us as interviewers. She has made this past year of my life in the OHMA cohort an incredibly rich, meaningful, and transformative experience, both in terms of the things I've learned and made and the beautiful and supportive learning environment she's curated and created. She creates a classroom environment where all opinions are welcome, mutual respect is fostered, participation is valued. She's an engaging, intelligent, and open instructor. She gives feedback like I've never seen before. It's incredibly thoughtful, detailed, and constructive. I truly don't know of anyone in another master's program anywhere who speaks as highly of their professors and the academic environment they've created. Amy's a true gift to OHMA and this university, and I feel so lucky to be learning from her. On behalf of all graduate students at Columbia University, we want to thank you for your demonstrating outstanding mentorship of students. Effective mentoring is not only the key to a successful graduate program, but its benefits will pass on as a tradition of quality mentoring practices through your students. Thank you, Ms. Erica Bauer, and congratulations to Professor Gamer, Professors Gamer and Staricheski. We will now recognize three PhD students with the Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching. These students were selected from a large pool of nominations by a committee that included both faculty and graduate students. The three students selected to receive this year's Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching are Benjamin Bershon, Department of Chemistry, Shulamit Shinar, Department of History, and Catherine Z, Department of Psychology. <laughs> First, Mr. Beshan. Mr. Beshan, over the last two years, you're teaching in the Department of Chemistry has earned you the highest praise from our faculty and students. You have gained a reputation as a selfless teacher, regularly going beyond the call of duty to provide a wonderful learning environment from which hundreds of students have benefited. You have revolution revolutionized how students experience a traditionally demanding course and have created a space in which a greater and more diverse number of students can succeed. Your students have universally praised you as an inspiration, citing your passion for the material as well as your enthusiasm and dedication as a teacher. It is with great respect, gratitude, and pride that we recognize your contributions and accomplishments in the classroom and beyond with the 2019 Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching by a Graduate Student.
mencionar. As a historian of the classical world, you have shared with your students your enthusiasm for the subject matter and for finding relevance and insight in ancient texts. You have inspired your students by helping them make connections across cultures and across time, guiding and encouraging them to experience the emotions presented in the texts. Your students repeatedly praise your ability to create an intellectually stimulating yet welcoming classroom environment. They commend your focus on inclusion, all while you push them to analyze more deeply and further develop their critical reading skills. You represent the best of what a teacher scholar can be, intellectually rigorous and accomplished, generous with your knowledge, time, and skills, and committed to thoughtfully conveying the insights of research to the un un uninitiated. It is with great pride and admiration that we join your students in thanking you and recognizing you with the 2019 Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching by a graduate student. Ms. Z. In your time at Columbia, you have combined outstanding doctoral research with extraordinary teaching, leading some of the most challenging and important courses for undergraduate and graduate students in the Department of Psychology. Your teaching excellence has served not only as a model for your students and your fellow graduate, graduate colleagues, but also as a model for other faculty who look to you for guidance in designing more creative assignments, defining clearer expectations, and fostering more inclusive classrooms. You possess an exceptional ability to translate your seemingly encyclopedic knowledge into engaging lessons that communicate complex content with varying levels of complexity. You scaffold students' learning, inspiring them to actively grapple with challenging material that previously thought was beyond their grasp. Your excellence in teaching extends far beyond the classroom. The more than 30 research assistants and honor students you have mentored can attest to the pivotal influence you have had on their development. Your passion for research, the rigor with which you approach every task, and your exemplary work ethic inspire your students, helping them to develop their own curiosity and pushing them to believe in their own capabilities as scientists. A brilliant researcher, an exemplary teacher, and a dedicated citizen to your department, the university, and your field as a whole, you're a wonderful, wonderful role model to our students in addition to our profession. In addition to our profession, we're proud to recognize your achievements with the 2019 Presidential Award for Teaching by a Graduate Student. Congratulations to Mr. Beshon, Ms. Shinar, and Ms. Z on their achievements. I am now very pleased to present the Dr. Devon T. Wade Mentorship and Service Award. This award recognizes a master's or doctoral student who most exemplifies a commitment to community building and mentoring as demonstrated by the late Dr. Devon T. Wade. The award was established in 2018 in honor of the life and work of Devon T. Wade when the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences conferred his doctoral degree posthumously. Wade had enrolled in the doctoral program in sociology at Columbia University in 2011 and came to be recognized as one of the university's most gifted doctoral students. Wade's dissertation research which focused on stigma, trauma, and discipline in the school setting, was recognized by distinguished awards, including the Harry S. Truman Scholarship, the Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellowship, and the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. Wade was passionate about teaching and creating inclusive learning environments, and he was deeply devoted, devoted to building networks of support and mentorship 
for students from groups that historically have been underrepresented in the academy. He was a founding member of the Columbia University Graduate Student of Color Alliance. The purpose of the Dr. Devante Wade Mentorship and Service Award is to recognize Columbia University graduate students whose work reflects Dr. Reflect Dr. Wade's exceptional commitment to scholarship, teaching, mentorship, and service. The selection committee is pleased to have selected as the inaugural winner of this award, Mr. Joss T. Green. Mr. Green, the committee selected you because of your demonstrated and consistent accomplishments in all of the areas recognized by this award. Research and scholarship, teaching and mentoring, professional and community service, and community building. Like Dr. Wade, you're a sociologist who studies prisons and the effect of incarceration on broad communities. As a scholar activist, who studies incarcerated trans women of color, you, you work alongside and together with members of affected communities and their advocates to create more just systems of incarceration and reentry in society. According to your peers who nominated you, you are, and I quote, a tremendous teacher and mentor for undergraduate and graduate students alike with your seminar, Race, Gender, Sexuality, and Punishment receiving high praise from your students. Congratulations, Mr. Green, and to all the nominees for the inaugural Dr. Devon T. Wade Mentorship and Service Award for your extraordinary work. We applaud you all. We now arrive at the central point of the ceremony, the presentation of the doctoral candidates. We ask you to come forth as we call your name in recognition of your individual accomplishments. Professor Richard Susarczyk, the Associate Dean of Academic and Student Affairs, will read the names of the PhD candidates as they approach uh, and cross the stage. Receiving the doctoral degree in anthropology, Juan Mazariegos. Fernando Montero. Myrtle Jones. Receiving the doctoral degree in applied mathematics, Roshan Sharma. Anurban Sina. Hawe Jai. Yunje Dao. Receiving the doctoral degree in applied physics and applied mathematics, Jeffrey Taylor. Jotirmoy Mandal. Receiving the doctoral degree in architecture, Meredith Gallego. Receiving the doctoral degree in art history and archaeology, Alex Weintraub. Arithi Menune. Lea Perez. Arena Tolstoy, Lorenzo Figotti, Michela de la Casa, Connie Choi, receiving the doctoral degree in astronomy, Gemma Wolcott Green, Andrew Emmerich. Receiving the doctoral degree in, in biological sciences, Wei Wang. Receiving the doctoral degree in cellular, molecular, and biomedical studies, Xiao Fu. He Wei Chung Feng. Yixuan Wu. Yinglu Zhang. Rosie Soon, 
Chen Chen. Yachian Chen. Vitelli Fomen. Jin Young Jo. Receiving the doctoral degree in biomedical engineering, Mirella Altoi. Jisun Park. Dovina Chu. Heiyun Ji. Yaxing Lao. Receiving the doctoral degree in biomedical informatics, Joseph Romano. Alexander Yahi. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in biostatistics, Peng Wu. Xiang Yu Hu. Xin Chao. Shang Hong Shi. Wu Dian Liang. Annie Li. Receiving the doctoral degree in business, Min Chen Zhang. Yuan Xiao. Ashley Carter. Alice Lee. Donna Cans. Jan Yomidvich. Sorry. Noah Castello. Rachel Mang. Francisco Castro. Faye Long. Yarit Evan. Ji Liu. Pu He. Receiving the doctoral degree in cellular physiology and biophysics, Michael Holsey. Jonathan Kim. Megan Belcher Dufresnay. Stephanie Sigmund. Margot Brandt. Nathan Johns. Daniela Georgieva. Receiving the doctoral degree in biological sciences, Hangzhou Dang. Receiving the doctoral degree in genetics and development, Ying Yang. Receiving the doctoral degree in chemical engineering, Nicholas Brady. Jack Davis. Connor Bilchak. Brian Tackett. Wen J. Fay. Elaine Gomez. Wala Abdullah. Receiving the doctoral degree in chemistry, Evan Dowd. Anastasia Vovadan. Eva Reza. Navet Bailey. Receiving the doctoral degree in chemical physics, James Shi. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in chemistry, Andrew Sho. Receiving Jinju Zhang. Receiving the doctoral degree in civil engineering and engineering mechanics, 
Apostolos Tsaros Andriopoulos. Katson Santos. Shanguk Yom. Receiving the doctoral degree in civil engineering and engineering mechanics, Lei Shuyu. Kun Wang. Daniel Bartelson. Gregory James Fitch. Receiving the doctoral degree in classical studies, Evan Jewell. Joe Shepard. Receiving the doctoral degree in communication, Charles Barrett. Diani Chitra. Tom Glacier. Berju Bykert. Receiving the doctoral degree in computer science, Richard Townsend. Timothy Sun. Sarah Levitan. Pritam Dutta. Jada Almashkbe. Noura Faro. Gang Ho. Receiving the doctoral degree in Earth and Environmental Engineering, Matthew Betame. Chang Chuan Zhou. Tarun Bambani. Jengbao Yai. Leo Lemordan. Sobrota Das. Nope. Receiving the doctoral degree in computer science, Andrea Lotorini. Marios Pominas. Matthias Lecouye. Receiving the doctoral degree in Earth and Environmental Sciences, Bjorting Jong. <laughs> Yenjo Tan. Ingja Wu. Colin Raymond. Laura Haynes. Juan Carlos de Obesos. Kira Olsen. Daniel Rasmussen. Caroline Leland. Francisca Landes. Elizabeth Schoenfeld. Rajib Rajin. Receiving the doctoral degree in East Asian Languages and Cultures, Danshin Zhou. Aijun Wang. Chi Zhang. Jeffrey Tyler Walker. Allison Bernard. Lei Lei. Receiving the doctoral degree in ecology, evolution, and environmental biology, Benjamin Clark. 
receiving the doctoral degree in economics, Christopher Cotton. Jeremy Ward. Oscar Soria. Pham Kwok An. Anurag Singh. Sun Kyung Lee. Wei J. John. Matthew Teachout. Christopher Gibson. Jing Jiang. Jiang Ying Chu. Jian Hun. Dayan Yen Xia. Xuan Li. Yun Ju Jo. Misak Matsumura. Rajinder Singh Moon. Receiving the doctoral degree in electrical engineering, Asif Ahmed. San Gultikin. Nathaniel Jing Lin. Nigar Reis Karim Mayan. Ghazal Fizil Nia. Alexander Gazman. David Giddeny. Chen Shi. Zheng Shu. John Shan. Anan Shang. Lian Chen. Oyuntude Ogundija. Receiving the doctoral degree in English and Comparative Literature, Benjamin Barish. Alex Fabrizio. Victoria Wyatt. Atafe Akbari. Alexander Paulson Lash. Sarah Arkbauer. Receiving the doctoral degree in epidemiology, Patrick Dawson. Eleanor Hayes Larson. Anton Palma. Mandy Shimon Goldberg. Beth Rubenstein. David Fink. Receiving the doctoral degree in Ro Fran French and Romance Philology, Rose Gardner. Sarah Lazar. Adam Azap. Receiving the doctoral degree in genetics and development, Margaret Kirkling. Maria Stupnikov. Michael Swellander. Receiving the doctoral degree in history, Hannah Elmer. Ethan Yi. Susanna Ferguson. Rachel Newman. Tanya Budacharya. Shulamit Shinar. 
Nicholas Mulder. Daniel Gunnar Kressel. AJ Murphy. Arthur Sorate. Harun Bulina. Receiving the doctoral degree in Italian, Alicia Palanti. Juliana Visco. Allison DeWitt. Receiving the doctoral degree in Latin American and Iberian cultures, Daniel De Silva. Daniela Wurst. Receiving the doctoral degree in mathematics, Elena Georgi. Bunjun Choi. Li Shi Zhang. Pak Hin Li. Chi Xiao Ma. Xiao Wei Tan. Wen Hua Yu. Mitchell Falk. Receiving the doctoral degree in mechanical engineering, Andrea Westervelt. Braden Zapla. Jenny Ardelion. Christopher DeMarco. Hao Han Zhang. Shengji Huan. Junyi Shang. Timothy Olson. Receiving the doctoral degree in microbiology, immunology, and infection, Michelle Miron. Mariana Postina Amida. Laila Yosef. Philippe Chetskovsky. Receiving the doctoral degree in music, Beatriz Goubert. Mark Hannaford. Ralph White. Paula Harper. Receiving the doctoral degree in neurobiology and behavior, Nina So. Blair Jenkins. Receiving the doctoral degree in nutritional and metabolic biology, Brian Jose Gonzalez. Steven Shekel. Catherine Show. Chung Yi Ju. Receiving the doctoral degree in nursing, Alum Tark. Receiving the doctoral degree in industrial engineering and operations research, Octavia Ruiz Locadelli. Receiving the doctoral degree in industrial engineering and operations research, Francois Fagan. Ni Ma. Norhan Sukar. Mario Escobar Santoro. Xiaopei Zhang. Xiangyu Wang. 
Mingxian Zhang. Xu Sun. Fei He. Ji Pen Liu. Receiving the doctoral degree in pharmacology and molecular signaling, Jose Quijada. <laughs> Namira Gasiernaskop. Oh, I'm sorry, receiving the doctoral degree in philosophy, Namira Gasiernaskop. <laughs> Borhain Lily Hamlin. Receiving the doctoral degree in physics, Jiang Han. Victor Jinti. Heather McCarrick. Andre Petrashki. Stefan Countryman. Receiving the doctoral degree in political science, Colby Hansen. Lindsay Dolan. Alicia Cooperman, Jacob Kopas, Jasper Cooper, Eslihan Segil, Nicholas Lotito, Summer Lindsay. Aaron Zobia. Joseph Sutherland. Camilla Vergara. Receiving the doctoral degree in psychology, Kate. Turetsky. <laughs> Jocelyn Sho. Receiving the doctoral degree in religion, Elizabeth Tinsley. Receiving the doctoral degree in Slavic languages, Robin Jensen. Holly Myers. Receiving the doctoral degree in social work, Philip Marota. Nan Jiang. Receiving the doctoral degree in sociology, Christina Chaka Eller. Nicole Valdez. Sarah Sachs. Receiving the doctoral degree in sociomedical sciences, Rana Popkin. <laughs> Stephanie Grillo. <laughs> Ijoma Kolawa. <laughs> Shoei Wen Wang, doctoral degree in statistics. Morgana Ostern. Jean Wu. Kashif Yosef. Edward Chang. Receiving the doctoral degree in sustainable development, Timothy Foreman. Meda Benatia Andalosi. Alice Tianbo Jiang. Denise Duki. Jason Chun Yu Wong. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in theater, Rosa Schneider. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in urban planning, Lauren Fisher. Maiko Nishi. Yunjing Li. 
Lian Ying Ha. Astrid Renata Lasilla Smith. Receiving the doctoral degree in applied behavior analysis, Liana Mellon. Receiving the doctoral degree in applied behavioral bi analysis, Brittany Belai. <laughs> Lara Gentilini. Sarah Silsila. <laughs> Sungun Yun Yun. Angela Chen. Receiving the doctoral degree in applied psychology, measurement, and analysis, Shaoliang Zhou. Yu Bai. Receiving the doctoral degree in behavioral nutrition, Catherine White. Adele Lee. Receiving the doctoral degree in clinical psychology, Lauren Shussel. Receiving the doctoral degree in cognitive studies and education, Mariana Lamnina. Shimin Kayai. G. Leo. Vinyana Sagada Hernandez. Receiving the doctoral degree in counseling psychology, Kishida Bowen White. Receiving the doctoral degree in economics and education, Sidra Rehman. Receiving the doctoral degree in English education, Ming Kyung Choi. Receiving the doctoral degree in mathematics education, Sun Young Ban. Eva Dubkowska. Receiving the doctoral degree in philosophy and education, Jessica Davis. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in social organizational psychology, Danielle Pfaff. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in social organizational psychology, Ariel Bernstein. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in speech and language pathology, Akila Rajapa. Receiving the doctoral degree in measurement and evaluation, Hedya Akhmadai. And now, my parting remarks to the graduating class. During your stay in this institution, we have, we have endeavored to train you how to think, write, and speak like members of an academic field as a participant in an intellectual community defined by the mores and conventions of your discipline, leaving in the process little room or time for, more, for much else. Indeed, looking back at the foundational myth of the modern university, one can detect readily a desire to place the institution in a location of exception with respect to the social, as an enterprise that derives its force and reason for being from its insularity, from its distance from societal concerns. This is part and parcel of the apprenticeship model of graduate education and explains to a large degree the sense of loneliness that we have all felt at one time or another while in graduate school, as if we all had to recreate for ourselves and within ourselves the principal tenets of our chosen discipline, and thus engage in a project of intellectual self-fashioning that necessarily had to keep the world at bay. Given the efforts that you have expended in achieving this goal, you would be justified in thinking that the triumph that you celebrate today surely should be enough. And yet, 
The Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset wrote in his Meditations on Don Quixote in 1914, just as the world was about to embark in a cataclysmic war, an aphorism that comes to mind to describe what I'm hoping to convey to you as you leave this institution. Yo soy yo y mi circunstancia, y si no la salvo a ella, no me salvo yo, which can be loosely translated as, I am myself and my circumstance, and if I do not redeem it, I cannot redeem myself. There has never been a more connected, more transnational infrastructure linking us instantaneously to other individuals than the one that has been built by the technological scaffolding of our dig digital world. But paradoxically, we have also never been farther away than we are now from experiencing a sense for the commons, farther from the belief that we have some responsibility to our brethren, and from the principle that what is best is what is good for the largest number of people. Arguments that rely on the assumption of the common good as a given appear to have lost their power of persuasion because what was once a given can no longer be assumed to have collective purchase and assent. It has taken us a long time to arrive at the melancholy realization that just because we can communicate with countless unknown individuals, we're not, by that very fact, creating a community. The university may have been created to keep the world at bay outside its walls, but we should not allow that mythological foundation to determine our relationship with our surroundings. The very distilled concentration, the monomaniacal attention to your intellectual projects that has allowed you to be where you are today is a decided strength, but it can also lead imperceptibly to a withdrawal from the world that is not that different in its effect from outright neglect. Struggling against the insular experience in which you had to immerse yourself to be successful in graduate school will perhaps be the most taxing, the most demanding task you will undertake in the next chapter of your life that begins today. Nonetheless, everything that you have learned at Columbia will only acquire its full significance when you're able to articulate its meaning for the commons. In spite of the requisite headlong plunge into our disciplinary milieu that has characterized your time as a graduate student, you, we, must never lose sight of the larger social context that will endow our work with its ultimate significance. We are, as a society, at peril of losing that sense of responsibility toward the common good without which our work will be diminished, but more important, without which no understanding or application of justice may sustain itself. Your studies have endowed you with powerful analytical tools and equally effective powers of persuasion, and you should, you should use them to protect the health of the social compact, to strengthen the resilience of our common bonds. Strive to be happy as an individual, but always keep in mind Ortega's admonition that if you do not have, if you do not also endeavor to redeem your circumstance, your own personal fulfillment will be in jeopardy. Never lose sight of the fact that many, many persons, even absolute strangers, have contributed, sometimes invisibly, to this very personal success of yours that we celebrate today, and that the best way to acknowledge that death is through your renewed commitment to the essential business of being human among and alongside other human beings. We arrive then at the end of this magnificent ceremony. Go forth and be our representatives and emissaries to the world, and all of us at Columbia will rejoice in your inevitable achievement. Make us and your relatives and friends prouder still about you than we are today. Will the candidates please stand so that we may give them a final round of applause.
You are all invited to a champagne reception immediately following this ceremony at Ansel Plaza under the tent. I ask friends and families to wait to exit until after the faculty and candidates have ascended the steps to upper campus. Family and friends on the east side of the lawn, again, we ask that you please wait for the graduates to exit before exiting the seating area. Those on the west side of the lawn, we ask that you please exit promptly so that we may prepare for our next ceremony. Please join us on Ansel Plaza for our reception. Thank you for coming.